Um, very uh, excited to um, announce Brian King, our next speaker, uh, who I've known for many years. Um, so his company is After Premise, and the AP Doc solution delivers complete and comprehensive documentation for the most complex of projects through intelligent automation, flexible workflows, and robust storage on the AWS platform. A simple pay-per-use pricing model, paying only for what you use, not for the number of users, while providing accessibility for contractors, subcontractors, and third parties as needed without any additional license costs to the project. Brian and I worked together at Oracle in what is now known as the Engineering Construction Business Unit. In his market development role, Brian was instrumental in defining the solution mix for the construction phase of the London 2012 Olympics, as well as several other large initiatives globally. Um, thank you, Brian, over to you. Thank you, Phil. Thank you, Phil. I'll just see if I can start my uh, video. No, not yet. Okay. I just can't start my video at the moment, but I'll, um, I'll just go in and... Um, oh, do that. Start with share your screen. Yeah, sure. Just give me one second. Okay, should start seeing me on video now. Um, um, one more thing, while my mic is hot, um, I just want to encourage people to put questions to Mark on that absolutely red hot presentation in Unify. Please uh, let us get your questions. Right, over to you, okay. Brian. Can everyone see my presentation and hear me okay? We can see PowerPoint, yes. Fantastic, welcome everyone. Good morning, thanks Phil. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about, uh, since it's a glimpse to the future, can we take a little glimpse into the future and think about what we might see coming up our way? Uh, and to do that, inevitably, I'm going to talk about the cloud. Um, but I'm going to differentiate the cloud usage. I'm going to pigeonhole people who've sort of moved their current architecture and basically are now just renting servers on the cloud. And then I'm going to move forward for a further glimpse of people who have sort of taken a moment to think about what the cloud might bring and thought about how they might throw the rule book away. Because I actually think we need to throw the rule book away in construction. I think, you know, just the, the low ad adoption of uh, technology within construction, something's holding people back. And, and it's easy to sort of have a pop at construction folk. But, you know, anyone, anyone, anyone that I've met that works in construction, they're fairly gung-ho, they're up for new ideas, they're up to try new things. So there's something still getting in the way. Uh, and so I'm going to tell you a story over 15 minutes. It has to be a short story. And I'm going to use a couple of quotes to, to help me on my way. Brian, I hate to interrupt you, but we're seeing presenter view. So if you went to your display settings and changed the monitor, then you, I think you'd be all set. Yeah, yes, right. I'm you're not live now. There you go. Thank you. I'm no, I think you want, you're, yeah, you're all sorted. Thank you. You're a star. Thank you, Phil. Um, so I'm going to tell you, I'm going to use two quotes to tell you a, a bit of a story. Uh, my first quote is one of my favorites. Um, it's from Isaac Newton. And, you know, he just, he just acknowledged that, you know, he used other folks' work to, to come up with, the, with his sort of thoughts on, on gravity. You know, you, you can't work in isolation. And he talked about standing on the shoulders of giants. And, and I think that's what we need to do. I think, you know, we looked out when we went to try and build this product. We looked for a big, friendly giant. And, you know, we, we settled on Amazon. We settled on Amazon AWS. Because for me, they've, they've really revolutionized the way we do retail globally. Um, they seem to be able to stand up a product that's available 24-7. And um, it just deals with things like Black Friday without them really breaking into a sweat. And, and I've been lucky in looking at Amazon and going to Amazon gigs that they've sort of introduced me to a few people who have, have really jumped all in and not just moved servers across, but really stopped thrown the rule book away and rethought how they were going to do things. And my two favorites are, are Netflix and, and, and something called the DVLA. So if you're not in the UK, uh, DVLA is the government organization that looks after all driver and vehicle licensing in the UK. Uh, and, uh, and imagine Netflix, you know, we're talking about a glimpse into the future, but hey, what if you're a content provider and hey, someone decided that most of the world had to be locked down for a while and we're looking around to consume box sets and stuff. Well, yeah, unsurprisingly, Netflix have been able to cope with that and cope with that quite easily. 
Um, so the disruption in their marketplace, they've been able to cater for. But Netflix really, really knocked the ball out of the park. If you listen to what they're doing, they, they do really clever stuff. You know, they don't actually have a server on their estate that's more than a month old. They, they run around the server deliberately deleting servers so that it stands up new instances. You think, oh, well, why would you do that? Because they've thought out of the box. They thought, well, if we can do this and it's easy, we never patch a server. We don't spend time with security patches. All of our servers are always the latest ones and up to date. And similarly with the DVLA, you know, they, in the if you don't know the UK car market, we we have these sort of registration plate changes, and it it makes people wait for a registration. So we have these peaks of purchasing and, and new licensing. Um, so they have to quickly deal with a, a, a lots of new vehicles coming on the road, and then they. they they sort of looked at the whole thing and said, actually, we're putting more and more of these services online because we can infinitely scale and then reduce back down. And it makes it very easy for them. So I think I'm going to talk about, as we glimpse into the future, cloud. The other things we liked was the storage. The storage is easy. Uh, the service level agreements Amazon give us means, you know, for every 10,000 documents we store, we might lose a document once every 10 million years. Well, you know, I can live with that. And, it, and it's quite cheap, you know, it's really cheap. So we just decided that we're going to store every version of every document that everyone gives us because we can afford to do it. And similarly with database records, you know, it's automatically writes our database record to two data, to two, two data centers and I can restore data uh, to any point, any point in time in the last 35 days without doing anything. That's just, just comes out of the box, um, which means of course, for me, that means we can concentrate on other things. We, we're not managing our infrastructure, so we can spend more time thinking about the app. And if I was looking at this um, as we glimpse into the future, could you ever imagine your, uh, your, your sort of groundworks contractor arriving on site and they've got no mechanical diggers or anything like that, and they're sort of rather eagerly pointing to 5,000 slaves they've brought along to help dig the, dig the foundations. You know, if we're, if we're really thinking about the cloud, we should be looking at what's available and building on the shoulders of giants. We should be adopting technology that makes it easy for us to concentrate on the stuff that's really interesting. Um, and for me, the real groundbreaker here is no longer needing your own servers. In fact, no longer using servers at all, just standing up bits of code and letting them run. Um, and I've got a number up there, but you know, if you think about how many hours in a month, you know, just how many hours do you actually use a piece of software in a month? And if we could do that, and if we could give you a pricing model that reflected that usage, could we then give it to more people? Could we increase adoption within the construction industry by making it just easy to use and cheap to use? So if you've got someone who's got a few bits of data points to give you, just give them some access for a while. It will cost you a few pence to process that data rather than many pounds per month for a user license. And then when, when we've got that sorted out, of course, we can then spend even more time. We've got much more bandwidth to think about solving real construction problems. So how do we get that thing that uh, DJ pointed to, that consistent repeatable outcome on a project where it's easy to find information? How can we hide complexity for people so that they will use it, they'll try it? And I'm going to show you a case study in a minute called uh, uh, Endura. It's a white label version of our AG Docs project. They've run 40 projects to date over the last couple of years. They've not run a single training course. For, um, of course, a few people have needed a help along the way, but there's been no formal training courses. It's very easy to use. And in fact, they've run some projects for Amazon themselves. Because of the pricing model, because of the ease of, the use, ease of use, they've been able to fundamentally change the point at which you can use these big uh, these big hairy enterprise solutions in on projects. This, they're now offering something that can scale not just up into enterprise, but down onto any project of any size. Um, and to do that, they've, um, they've come up with, um, we've come up with um, a set of standardization. So we can define what good looks like through templates. What sort of documents do we want and how do we want to track them to make sure it's successful 
And if you templatize it, then it's repeatable. We can use it on every project and we can mix and match to get any project. Now that gives us three advantages when we do this. First of all, we can stand up a structure at the very start of a project and let everyone see it. And that's great because we get away from the sort of contractors and stuff saying, oh, I didn't, didn't understand that, I didn't price for that, I'm not doing that. Um, the other thing is if you're an end user, an asset owner or a main contractor, you can take your standards and push them down into your supply chain so that you get a consistent response back, which is really great. And then the other thing, of course, you've stood something up here, which is available from day one of the project. And if you stand something up at day one of the project, we can then get the software to go and get the data from people while they're still on your project. So we don't push document gathering and record keeping to the handover stage when everyone's running around with their hair on fire. A lot of the documentation is available, signed off, way in advance of the, uh, of the project delivery. And then, of course, we get, you've got this sort of live, living document repository, and that repository we can hand over into the asset owner operator, and they can keep that document live all the way through the life cycle of the asset. Um, the other thing that we've done is we've just followed process. It's very easy to follow the process, and we can target process for different types of document. If there's a design element, we might want the construction team and the client to sign it off. If it's just working from architects, drawings that already agreed, we might just want the build team. So again, we can, we can process appropriately for each individual data item, but make sure we're consistently doing it all the time. And then automate as much as possible. The software runs around chasing people. It's constantly checking what's going on. It's constantly checking against the schedule and it's giving people advance warning of what's going on. And it makes sure that there are no surprises. You don't get to the end of a project or you don't get to the end of a stage and someone lets you down, which I'm afraid means that you let the end client down or the end client is just disappointed. So let's, let's have a look at it in one form or another. Um, the Endura one is white labeled and we're quite relaxed about giving people their own instances. People regularly ask me um, what I do. Um, Mark people tend to insist that I have some sort of a yeah elevator pitch um, most people use this by going to the simple form they just go along and it just gives the software constantly throwing out to do items please do this please check that so you don't really know you need to know the structure of the document or the drawing you've just got something to do and off you go so there's not a lot of training uh, the forms are fairly self evident and then someone says well what, what what's that well if everyone does that you end up with a repository and again we've got a lot of technology that's doing indexing it's learning indexes it's doing searching um, it's going through now imagine um, imagine um, someone a couple of years ago or three years ago asking most of the people who own tall buildings in the UK what sort of cladding have you got so that's a real life thing where I'm pretty sure that I wouldn't need to take my shoes and socks off to, to figure out how many people could do that very easily and what we let, what I tend to do with people is I say, well, actually, you can just do it on a phone. So there it is. You just run through, run through doing that, file listing, what sort of cladding have we got on that site? Yes, the data sheet says all the cladding. What else have we got on there? Uh, I wonder what this Kingspan thing is. Yeah, there's a product sheet for the cladding on the building. So it's very easy to do. So we're gathering data. We're tracking data. We're going all the way through looking at it. Uh, it's nice, easy structures. Um, this shouldn't look like it's difficult or rocket science. You can only get permission for the products you see. All consistent structures. Uh, there are projects running here in the US, Germany, and the UK. Um, these guys have been able to stand up four projects since the lockdown because really you don't need to be on site or on the job site to do this anymore. You can just do it from anywhere, review it from anywhere stand it up from anywhere. That should look like a fairly standard health and safety file to most people. If I go into mechanical services, there's the mechanical services manuals that are on this site. If I go into plumbing, there's my record drawings. And this is gonna be consistent across every manual. So people get very used to the structures. Um, I'm not gonna show you anything super secret, um, but there is, yeah, that's just outside loo that the lorry drivers probably use while they're waiting to get their lorries delivered, they're filled up before they make the journey. 
And of course, it keeps a history of everything that's happened to that document with every version of that document stored away. Um, it's all very, very simple. It's not rocket science. We're trying to make this as usable as possible so that as many people as possible use it. Uh, no place to hide, though. Um, everyone sees the dashboard. We can see the status of every manual, where all the documents are, and we can see who is actually holding the project up if they're struggling with the number of reviews or the number of documents we've got. So again, we tend to get things delivered. We tend to get things delivered on time because the software is automatically tracking all this. And because the software is doing most of the grunt work, um, the, uh, the document controllers are going a bit further. They're managing more than one project at a time, which again is pushing down the price point in the project to the end user or the construction manager. So that's a very, very simple view of, of AP docs and the data we get. And then we took a big step back from this. So this has been running along for a while. And someone came along a year ago and said, well, that's very interesting, but could you do something along the lines of uh, certification and compliance with this? And we took the opportunity. So I'm showing you the later version of the software now, this year's version. Um, and yeah, so we just built extra workflows. All we did is the same software. It's running the same document, template structures. Um, we've just taken the workflow and made it a lot more flexible. Uh, this guy here basically looks at uh, looks after most of the welding equipment in most of the large engineering businesses in the UK. Um, if I open the project, it's a different project structure, much smaller project. Um, at the time, I had no idea uh, that <laughs> certifying welding equipment was so complex, uh, but it spits out one to four documents when you test the machine, apparently. Uh, there are, these are the asset numbers for the documents. If I go in here, I can see that document, fair enough. And the same history is there as well, which is fine. Uh, but in this particular case now, of course, that history is tied to a document version number. There's the document for 2015, and there is the document there for 2016. The innovation now for this year is we take all of the data in a row, including the version number, and we encrypt it and we put it in a blockchain, which means you cannot change that record at all. If anyone changes it, it would no longer match the encryption. And the other thing we do is we take the record here and the encryption for that record here, and I put it in the next record along here, this one here, which means there's a relationship between these two records by a chain, which means I can't insert a record between the two. I can't come along later and say, oh yeah, I also said this. It just can't happen. And we put that to the back and it's shared by all projects on our solution, which means it's completely neutral. No one has access to it. It just sits there holding records and chaining them together, which means we've got a completely immutable single version of the truth for all our projects. There is nowhere to hide now. We know exactly what we said against which version of the document and we know when you did it, which is great, which is great. So, and we've been very successful. People get quite excited about that final immutable version of the document. So the last thing I'm going to show you is just a little bit of demo data about thinking out the box, that look into the future. If you think about this stuff where you're serverless, you can pay for when you use it, you don't have to worry about user licenses, what else could you do with it? What other data points could you use? Well. Clearly, you know, you can use, use it to track images, so site progress photographs. Clearly, if you're using drones and things, well, just stick those in as well and put them in the repository. And then you stop and think. You stop and you think. You think, I wonder if we could do it with BIM. I wonder if we could run BIM completely serverless so that we no longer have to pay for a BIM server and whether we could do that as well using serverless models. And that would be quite interesting, wouldn't it? So if I'm just version I'm in. Oh, hang on. Let me just um, let me just do something a bit different here. Let me just do it here for a sec. I know exactly what I've done. Um, well, What if we could just, at this point, switch on the BIM server? It's not a BIM server now, it's a BIM service. And I've now started paying for using BIM. But I haven't been paying for a BIM server for the last 5,000 hours of this month. Or last month, I'm paying for it from now. 
and I can uh, go through and uh, start to uh, start to use my BIM. So I can go down, I can do all the normal things we can do with BIM. I can switch the X-ray on, I can drop into the model. Uh, model. Spin around to my half to ten. It's a data point, everything. We're treating data as objects. We don't really care what sort of files we've got. Um, I can switch back on. Um, I'm constantly moving around, moving things, and I can sort of click on stuff, hide things, do that sort of stuff. This is great, Brian. Here we do. Um, I can um, identify if I click on that there. Um, I stand up now the index server. The index server will stand up, and that will tell me that it's a Google Pivot Access um, bits and pieces. And then just to make my um, just to make my circular part of the last bit of the demo, of course, I can click on the cladding. It tells me what the cladding is, and I can run the same index search from within the BIM model. So I'm dealing with now any data, any data point, and any point that's fully record driven. We know exactly what's going on. Uh, for those of you who haven't fallen asleep during my presentation, I'm just going to hint a little bit here. You can see that we can now take, we're, we're announcing this formally next month, but we can update our offline trackers and sheet with the latest history of any document that comes from a blockchain and the BIM integration. We can take out any sort of data of any type, Kobe spreadsheets, area extracts. And at this point, the service has gone to sleep. So actually, I've stopped paying for BIM now. Brian, that's great. That's really great. Okay. Can I uh, can I interrupt you at this point? Is that okay? You, you can. If that's uh, if I can just uh, yeah, that's fine. No, you can interrupt. That's okay. I I just think that that's really impressive what you've what you've shown us, and um, it's uh, it's the future, isn't it? The um, the way that people will be going serverless and paying for only what they use and the the fact and this is going to have a profound um it's going to have profound uh, impact on uh, licensing models and the software industry in general 